crabapple tree is considered a deciduous flowering tree that is small in stature, often between 30 to 50 feet in height. A deciduous tree is one that has leaves during the spring and summer growing seasons, but will go dormant in the fall and winter months and drop its leaves. Crab apples are defined as any small tree in the Malus genus, which is the same plant genus as regular apple trees, and both are in the Rosacea plant family, which is the same plant family as roses. The crab apple tree originated in the mountainous regions of Central Asia, specifically in modern day Kazakhstan, but it can be found in temperate regions of the northern hemisphere, including Russia and China. They also inhabit the temperate regions of North America since they were introduced to the Western Hemisphere in the 18th century. They tend to be found in relatively open areas with lots of sun exposure and good air circulation. These trees do not have a particular soil preference. They do best in moist, well-drained, and slightly acidic soils. However, they are also highly adaptable to poor soils, and they can endure various soil acidities, soil compaction, drought, pollution, wounding, and even some heavy pruning. This adaptability gives these crab apples a very high urban tolerance. They became popular cultivars, which are trees that are often used for selective breeding purposes, and they spread throughout the continent via the Silk Road. Romans brought the species from Asia into Europe, where the species experienced a rapid diversification into over 800 distinct species. It became the cultivar of choice in Europe, particularly in Britain and was eventually brought into North America, where they are currently found in abundance, and in some areas even considered native. In fact, there is actually an Iowa crab apple, which is not only native to Iowa, but it's the only plant that has the state's name in its, in its scientific nomenclature, Malus Iowensis. It has several common names as well, including the prairie crab apple, the Iowa crab apple, the western crab apple, the prairie crab, the Iowa crab, and the western crab. This tree is described as being a miniature tree in most respects, which will grow to about 35 feet in height with a dense irregular form. It can sometimes be a spiny shrub looking thing or just a small tree with spreading branches and an open crown. It produces a yellow to green apple-like fruit and is not considered to be ornamental by crab apple standards. There is a variety of Iowa crab that is grown as an ornamental, which has been described as a handsomely double flowered variety. The Iowa crab apple is quite important from an ecological perspective though, as the fruits are eaten by many species of birds like bobwhite quails and pheasants, as well as squirrels, rabbits, and other small mammals. The crab apple is considered a self-sterile flower, meaning that pollen from flowers on its own tree won't produce fruit. This also means that it is completely reliant on insects and other pollinators in order to produce the fruit that give the trees their name. They do cross-pollinate with other varieties of crab apples, so determining individual species within the genus is very difficult. Crabapple flowers tend to be white, pink, or red in their petal color, with darker buds that bloom during the April and May months. This makes them one of the earliest flowers available to pollinators in the spring. Flowering may not occur to the same extent every year, and crabapple trees could alternate between years of heavy, showy flowering and fruiting and years of only moderate flowering and fruiting. The fruits of the crabapple tree are round and fleshy and typically red, yellow, orange, or green in color. The fruits belong to the pom variety and are used to attract mammals, which tend to take them and distribute the seeds. They tend to be between a quarter to three quarters of an inch in diameter, and they mature in dense, showy clusters, appearing the months of September or October, but they can hang on to the tree until as late as December. The fruits are edible for human consumption, and can vary in flavor from quite acidic and sour tasting to fairly pleasant tasting. Often folks will use them in jellies and ciders. Although about only 30 species of apple trees exist, hundreds of hybrids are available. Gardeners tend to choose these cultivars based on flowering time, disease resistance, color, and fruit taste. Early flowering crab apples include Alden Heminus, the Siberian crab apple, Hybrids with interesting foliage include Ilii, which has purple leaves that contrast with its red flowers and purple fruit, Elise Rathke, which produces green apples with pink blushes, and Malus Troloboda, which has red leaves that resemble maple tree leaves. Well-known types that have good tasting fruit, including Transdescent, Centennial, and Dolgo. 
Maypole is a dwarf variety, also with tasty fruit. With the abundance of variety, the ease of care in growing, and added ecological benefits, it is no wonder that they are such a popular tree variety amongst landscapers, gardeners, and homeowners. It is also for these benefits that this was one of the first tree collections that was started at the Arboretum when it first began in 1970. As David Horst explains a bit of the history of the crabapple collection that we have and how it came to be here at the Bickle Hop Arboretum. When was, do you have any idea when the crabapple collection was first planted then? Uh, the first planting in the crabapple collection was in 1970. 1970? Yeah. All right, and it's been going on pretty well ever since. So Dave, how many crabapples were planted that first round? There were 24 crab apples planted in 1970. How did those crab apples arrive? Okay, there was 24 of them, and the Bickle Hops had ordered them from a nurseryman from Vincennes, Indiana. Okay. Nursery called Simpson Nursery. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, they filled out the paper for 24, 1 through 24. Mm -hmm. The first one, for example, was maybe dull gold crab apple. So they had a 1 there. But as they went down the list, 1 through 24, instead of putting 1 in front of every one, they increased their number by 1. So so they ended up at 24 at the end. The nurseryman took that as 24 of that particular crab apple. Of that variety. So instead, yeah. of, instead of just listing them, this is my first one, this is my second one, this is my third one, at the nursery they looked at that as, oh, they want one of these, two of these, three of these, four of these, five of these, all the way down to 24. That's correct. And Mr. Bickhop always said that the secretary for Mr. Simpson at Simpson's Nursery questioned it, but Mr. Simpson thought that they actually wanted that many. So they had that many shipped. That They had that many shipped, and Mr. Bickhop always claimed that when they came on a big flatbed truck, it was in like a big coffin-like box mm -hmm. to contain them all. Mm -hmm. They were bare root at that yeah. time, so they all fit in there. But he said it was a very large box, and uh, they knew right away there was something amiss when they saw the size of the crate that they were in. And of course, upon opening it, there was a lot of plants, and they only had ordered 24. So to help solve the problem, and Mr. Simpson was kind to the Arboretum, he donated the 24 that they had requested. Okay. So to be kind to Mr. Simpson, Mr. Bicklehop went and talked to some local nurserymen and asked if they'd be willing to buy them at wholesale cost, mm -hmm. which is what Simpson Nursery does. Okay. They're a wholesale outfit. Mm -hmm. The other nurseries that Mr. Bicklehop talked to agreed that they would buy them. So Mr. they bought all the extras. So we got... The 24 different varieties, you know, one of each of those, you kept, they planted, they put in, all the extras went to local nurseries who then sold them and then I'm assuming they paid back the nursery once the plants were sold? That's correct. All right. And that was, again, prior to the internet. And right. so that's one of the ways that mistake can happen if it's all pen, paper, mailing things back and forth, maybe yep. on the telephone. So I'm guessing they didn't, because that's kind of surprising that the secretary was like, I think this is odd, but nobody thought to call and say, no, no, this is this is how this is supposed to be. Right. And, and those nurseries that sell wholesale, of course, they were selling to other nurseries. They're yeah. used to dealing with big numbers. And this was probably small potatoes, and they didn't think... This would be other. small potatoes, one of each. <laughs> so they just assumed that they were ordering in quantity. Ordering in quantity. That's really interesting. Normally, they sell 5, 10, 50, 50 100, or whatever. Yeah, of, yeah. Each, of each variety anyway. So 24 is of nothing. one type is nothing, <laughs> because they're going to have 24 customers who are going to want it. So yeah. it was probably odder to them that they were only ordering one at a time in right. some ways. Yep. Well, oh, that's right. Now, did he get a lot of his uh, plant material from various wholesalers in that way? Yes. Over the years, uh, we've been very fortunate. The nurseries really like to actually donate the plants. Okay. So it's, we're not always buying them or we can buy them at a cheaper price. Yeah. Because they know that if we plant it here and we label it, we have visitors come and see it, they're going to ask where they can buy that. Exactly. So it's it's a little bit of advertising for them. It's to a certain, And it's yeah. low cost advertising, yeah. word of mouth advertising that you don't have to worry about hiring somebody special to do this or a marketing campaign. If we know that, you know, if people look at our, our the trees and stuff here and are like, this is something I can put in my house house and here's what it's going to look like after so many years yep. if I take care of it they're more than happy to, to ask those questions yep. and have the information given to them yep that's right okay so that's a benefit to us yeah it saves us a lot of money it does save us a lot of money and it still keeps things going here and it helps with the education part as well is, yep. is my guess and we're on the front edge of getting the new plants that are being introduced and released at the same yeah. time so because we, as, as we've said before you know this a lot of these plants they, they live out their life they're dealing with the elements the heat the drought the water all that's the yeah. wind and they need to be replaced at times and you guys are replacing them with stuff that's you know like you said the hot stuff in the market so to speak in some ways yeah underneath of the crab apple collection the first year 
there was planted 100 King Alfred and 100 Mount Hood daffodil bulbs. These were planted in a random pattern on the hillside amongst these crabapple trees. For the next four years following, 200 additional daffodil bulbs would be planted each fall for a total of 1,000 bulbs underneath all of the crabapple trees in the collection. As David explains, these bulbs were naturalized and not mowed down until after their life cycle and growing season has been complete. And they are added benefit to the crabapple collection that we have here at the Arboretum. And then under those crabapples, to bring the people in, they started with 200 daffodil bulbs a year for five years. That's right. Do they quit after five years? Uh, they quit for a while, and then we started digging up those as we were planting trees. And if we were planting a tree, and if we were putting a bed of wood chips around it to protect the tree, of course, mm -hmm. and keep it healthy. If there was a clump of bulbs there, we would dig those up and replant them. Okay. If there was 30 bulbs in it, we'd plant two to a hill, and so we'd have another 15 clumps. 15 clumps. Yeah. And we'd fill in, usually we'd pick holes within the existing collection where they planted the original bulbs. And we'd try to fill it in to make a solid display of flowering. And you let those just go and let them flower, and then after a while, you, you wait to uh, mow those down until after they've gone and, and done their most of their life cycle for the most part, correct? That's right. After the foliage completely dies, turns yellow and turns brown, after that we go in and we'll cut it off and clean it up. Usually it involves raking the grass. Then it greens back up. We always want to let the plant produce enough energy for its use for next year. Okay. You don't want to cut them off too soon. Over time, the crabapple collection has changed quite a bit as trees mature and live out their life cycles and are then in some instances replaced by Arboretum staff and volunteers. Dave goes on to explain a little bit about these changes and how they've occurred at the Arboretum and what goes into the decisions and the planning processes as the crabapple collection changes over time. How many are currently in the collection? How many crab apples? Uh, I'd say park. about 15. About 15, so we've gone down a little bit. We've gone down now that they've matured and taken up more space. And they are continually, we continue to try to evolve with the crab apple collection. There's some different diseases and insect problems with them. So we're down to about 15 right now. And our bread and part of our job is to always go in and study the plants, see how they're performing. And when they don't perform, we remove them mm -hmm. and uh, select a new selection. And we get help with this process from Dr. Jeff Isles, who's the head of horticulture at Iowa State okay. University. Yep. He's also known as Mr. Crab Apple. Oh, is he? I did not know that. He's an expert with crab wow. apples. We're fortunate to have him on our grounds committee to help us with these selections because he's on the forefront of the plant development world. He knows what's new and what's good and what we should plant here at the Arboretum. With a limited amount of space here at the Arboretum with 15 acres, we like to focus on the best selections that are available. Yeah. Because uh, you want to showcase, this is you know this is a museum. Right. You're trying to showcase the best yeah. and the and the, the brightest, so to speak, of that particular type of plant. Right. You don't want to go select a plant that is susceptible to fire blight or apple scab, and then have you come visit the arboretum, see the name tag, and say, well, that must be a good plant because it's growing here at the arboretum, and you go and spend good money on it, and, and then find out it's it, not going to work at my house. Yeah. Right. Have it lose its leaves in the middle of the summer. Man, that is so that there is a lot of, of research that goes into any one of these collections from the forefront and then during as well to make sure we've got everything we need and that yes there's there's nothing that is uh, not showing its best and brightest here and that we don't make mistakes. That's correct. Uh, we're constantly reviewing the plants. We have them all on a computer program uh, access. Mm -hmm. We can go in and we can look and see if they've had problems in the past. Dr. Isles, who I mentioned earlier from Iowa State University, he comes and he came last November and we review, we walk the complete grounds and we look at the trees, see how they're performing, how they're doing, or if they've suffered storm damage like mm -hmm. in the derecho. And then we review them and make decisions at that time. So, so it's continually evolving. It's continually evolving. Continually. Yeah. yeah. So the 15 crab apples that we have left, are those all from original or are those all from 1970 or has some of those swip swapped and you've replaced and gone through and things like that? I'd say there's probably only 10 or 15 percent left from the original. Oh, OK. So, so unfortunately, about two or three, about two or three from the original. unfortunate in a way, but it's also good that we update the class. Yeah. Well, that, not only that, because you know, that tells me, okay, here we are, 2022, those crab apples were planted in 1970, you know, you start with 24 in 
the span of 50 years now, we were down to two or three that were original. That tells me, okay, if you're going to plant a crab apple, you, know, you don't have 50 years, chances are. You, you've more like maybe got 10, 15, 20 years in, to enjoy that tree, and then you're going to have to probably replace it. Yeah. And that's probably another thing that you guys are thinking about as folks come and look at your collections and ask you questions. One of those questions probably is, what's the longevity of this in my yard? That's right. 50 years is a pretty good term for a crab apple. Yeah, for a crab apple. Versus like an oak tree or a ginkgo tree that can live well beyond that or up into hundreds of years. Yeah. But yeah, we feel it's very important. Plus, if we planted a tree in 1970, for example, a crab apple, if we planted a tree, a crab apple in 1970, today a lot of those would not be found at any of the nurseries. Mm. So if you come here and saw that tree, like Dolgo crab apple, good luck going out and trying to find a Dolgo crab apple that you can buy for your yard. Yeah. Okay. So that's because the industry is changing and evolving just as much as everything else. That's is. right. They're constantly studying new plants that are better. They bloom longer, have prettier, showier flowers, different colors, better shapes, and less disease and insect problems. So that's a benefit also of purchasing new plants for our collection here at the grounds is people that come and view it can actually find the plant and buy it. Well, the crab apple collection at the Arboretum is a great way for people to see some of the better ornamental crab apple varieties that are on the market. The big question for some people may be, what are the benefits of planting a crab apple tree in my landscape? David discusses some of these benefits of having a crab apple tree on your property that are both aesthetically pleasing as well as some of the benefits to surrounding wildlife that these trees provide throughout the year. What benefits do crab apple trees give homeowners, landscape folks, or the general public on their property? So we talked a lot about our crab apple collection, and you know, a lot of the reason it's there is to sort of show people and showcase what they could do in their landscape. So what could people do with crab apples in their landscape? Well, Ryan, first and foremost, the uh, crab apple trees are among the most prized ornamental trees uh, grown here in the Midwest, and they're absolutely beautiful when blooming in the spring. A lot of people, I mean, who doesn't like to see trees blooming or shrubs or flowers? Uh, so they're very popular for their blooms that they provide. Uh, I believe this is the number one reason most people have one in their yard, or two or three. It's just for the flowers, especially in the spring. Right. The average homeowner, I believe, is due to the flowers. Okay. Uh, but they are also an important early source of pollen for bees, excellent source of food for birds. The birds that overwinter here particularly need food at that time of the year, especially if we have a heavy snow cover or mm -hmm. icy mm -hmm. snowpack. The fruit may be small and sour to us humans, but to cardinals, robins, cedar wax wings, and many other birds, uh, they're especially drawn to the crab apples. Okay. Uh, they tend to stay on the tree for an extended period of time, which makes them desirable to these birds and mammals. The fruit does. The fruit does, yes. yep. Here at the Arboretum we see all the birds I've mentioned plus we see a lot of deer over there. They'll even stand on their hind legs to reach the lower limbs once they've got the ones that are easily accessible. Okay. Uh, they'll stand on their hind legs to reach the higher ones. So it sounds like the benefits of, of having a crab apple, if, if you're a homeowner that wants wildlife, early on the flowers themselves provide probably one of the earlier pollen sources for your bees and your wasps and your other things that like that need pollen early on, especially when like they're just coming out and getting ready for the spring. And then the fruits, once the fruits are made, because they last so far into the late fall and winter season, they're a wonderful uh, food type of food for a lot of your overwintering birds and your mammals and your deer. That's right. When a lot of other food sources have dried up or, mm -hmm. not, or are not available to them. Yeah. Okay. And another very important benefit of crab apples for homeowners is the leaves in the fall have an attractive fall color. And oh, then that okay. fruit, after the leaves fall off, the fruit become more visible. Yeah. and persist like we just mentioned throughout the winter so you have that fruit show throughout the winter. What common colors then are the leaves as they turn? Because I know maples are usually like a red or a yellow or an orange. Do crab apples have a distinctive fall foliage color? Uh, most of the crab apples that we have in our collection here at Bickle Hop Arboretum tend to be on the yellow or golden side. Oh, okay. Uh, which is still attractive with it the is. green grass. Exactly, with the green grass. Or even if you know, you're know you a homeowner and you have a couple trees, maybe you've got a maple that's really, really red, and now you have this crab apple that's also a yellow gold. You get a couple yep. different colors, which is very nice in the fall foliage scheme of things. Yep, that's right. As we can see, crab apple trees provide many benefits to the landscape. But as David points out, there are obstacles, considerations, and maintenance concerns that come along with planting and caring for crab apple trees that may be a bit unique compared to other tree varieties that people use on their property. 
What obstacles, though? So a homeowner, you know, we've seen, talked about the benefits of why a homeowner would want a crab apple and some of the ecological benefits from owning a crab apple tree in your yard. What obstacles, though, does a person have if they want to plant a crab apple? Well, first off, I think there's a number of obstacles, uh, and I'm not saying that crab apples are a problem tree. This is there's obstacles with any type of tree. Okay. If you look far enough, you can find them. But with crab apples, I would have to say one of the drawbacks to planting a crab apple tree would be the mess made from the fruit. Oh yeah. A lot of people don't think of this when they go to the nursery and look for a tree. This is typically not a problem as long as some thought was given to the location when planting. Mm-hmm. Uh, personally, I would not recommend planting them near driveways or cement walks. Gotcha. Because uh, you're not always going to step on the fruit as it comes off. And can become slippery. Yeah. And, but it becomes a mess and mm-hmm. and a liability. It could, yeah. Pruning is also important. They tend to grow a fair number of water sprouts from the trunk and limbs. Suckers tend to grow from the trunk near ground level. Okay. The canopy can also become quite dense if left unpruned, so it's very important to keep them pruned. Uh, if you do not prune them, the suckers and the water sprouts mm-hmm. can become quite large. I've seen them four or five feet long. Wow. And, inch and a half across. Now those suckers in the water, are they, are they drawing energy then from the main part of the tree? And that's important. They draw energy from the tree. Okay. And is that could potentially weaken the core, if you will? Of that that's tree. correct. And thus the longevity of your tree might be limited then if you don't prune it properly. That's right. Very important pruning is. So instead of having a nice tree, you then have a crab apple almost bush that really isn't real attractive, isn't really doing ecologically what it needs to do. And won't last that long anyways. That's right. Uh, Crab apples are also susceptible to several major diseases which can cause early defoliation, disfigurement, and weakening of the tree. There are a number of diseases that commonly occur on crab apples in home plantings and a couple of the most common would probably be scab and cedar apple rust. Oh, okay. Which I think, if I remember right, apple rust is a type of fungus, correct? Correct. All right. Uh, They're both caused by a fungus and they both affect the fruit and the leaves. Uh, These are both usually encountered to some degree nearly every year in this area. They're both common problems. Because it's probably a windborne fungus, isn't it? Correct. It's blowing in the wind, as they say, and so, yep. you know. And it's very common, and people don't have to become alarmed if they notice something on their tree and if it's one of those two problems. A little bit more of a serious disease would be fire blight, and mm. it's recognizable by lesions on the bark. Oh, okay. Uh, whereas the other two were more on the fruit and the leaves. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. This is actually lesions, and whenever you have lesions on a plant, that's not good. It's not a good sign. Uh, it's a wound. Yep, yep. And you can recognize the lesions. They may be a watery, oozing from the wound, a tan liquid color. Eventually, the disease can spread to the fruit and flowers and even eventually death to the tree. Okay. So this is more of a serious problem. The other ones are more... Cosmetic? Cosmetic. Yeah. And bother the person more. The leaves may prematurely drop in the summertime on the other two problems, but typically the tree will come back year mm-hmm. after year. It just looks unsightly at that time. And, yeah. and it can weaken the tree if it does it a number of years uh, in a row. Because my guess is the rust, at least with the leaves... It's uh, prohibiting photosynthesis and things like that, so thus the leaves not getting, or the tree's not getting as much energy, but it also means that's why your leaves might fall because they're getting covered and the plants are, in it as a defense of themselves, if they know that they've got certain leaves that aren't getting what they need, either they're not getting the amount of light they need or anything else, they'll drop those leaves and get rid of them as a yep. way to sort of protect themselves and not put energy towards something that's really not going to do them any good. That's right. Okay. And I can't stress enough, you know, how important careful plant selection is Mm -hmm. uh, as we discussed in another podcast the arboretum is here to showcase the top plants to people yeah so that they don't come here and buy a plant that has disease or insect issues exactly Uh, they're expensive to buy Uh, crab apples is probably one of the most important to make proper selections of there are many really good disease resistant cultivars on the market Mm -hmm. But there are just as many poor ones. Oh yeah. And so doing a little bit of a, of, of education ahead of time, a little bit of research. Ahead come of to time. the arboretum and go see to the arboretum, action. see what we got here, <laughs> and then you know think about it from there before you go and pick out your your crab apple. That's very important to do a little research on it. With many of these diseases, sanitation is also important in controlling the problem. Uh, leaf cleanup in the fall, mm-hmm. okay. which helps remove the fungus yep, from yep. overwintering yep. in a protected location, and mm-hmm. the leaf litter and uh, also the removal of the dead branches yeah okay because those dead branches could be there as well because of various types of fungus and like everything. fire blight like fire blight and stuff yep. like that so 
All right. Are, are crab apple trees real expensive? They never used to be, but all it seems like all plant material has really gone up the last huh. 10, 15 years, and trees are no different. No different, yep. Their okay. cost has gone way up, so they become more expensive. Gotcha. The transportation cost and oh, raising yeah, the material yeah, and everything yeah. for the nurseries. It all goes to that supply chain as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. The crab apple collection is just one example of the flowering trees that it, the Arboretum has on display in the spring. David and I discuss some of the other flowering trees that can be seen at the Arboretum and how they are a bit different from the crab apples and thus present people with a different a range of options that could be used in their areas for different landscape needs. So the crab apple is one example of a spring flowering tree here at the Arboretum. Does the Arboretum have any other those spring flowering trees that people could see while they're out and about here? Yes, as a matter of fact, we have a real nice selection of trees with spring blooms. And of course, this is one of our most visited times of the year in the springtime when the trees are blooming, the shrubs and the flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, makes for a wonderful visit for visitors. Of course, some of these have flowers which are much shorter than others. Mm -hmm. As you know, Ryan, uh, even maple trees flower in the springtime quite early they do but their flowers aren't real significant from a distance yeah, although if you walk up they are kind of neat in yeah, a way they, we would call those non-showy flowers non-showy is, non is a good name for them versus at the it. crab apples are very showy yeah, and the big difference between the maples and the crab apple flowers is, is the crab apples are pollinated by pollinators the maple ones are pollinated by the wind so they don't have to show off as much because they're going to get their stuff their business done in the breeze whereas the crab apples like i have to have somebody else come here and pick up my pollen yeah. and distribute it and go from there so that's a good point some of our top flower performers besides the crab apples are magnolias uh, they're one of our show stoppers like mm -hmm. the crab apples uh, cornelian cherry has a small flower but still significant it blooms in march oh, which oh. is kind of unique like the yeah. witch hazels bloom in february and march okay. uh, just that early performance is mm -hmm. unique also we have tree lilacs carolina silver bells red buds are another one of my favorites i just love that color of oh them. yeah it's very striking. Uh, and pagoda dogwoods name a few. So there's plenty of other flowering trees other than crab apples. So for instance, if a person didn't want to buy a crab apple because they didn't want to deal with the, uh, the fruit problem or things like that, uh, things like the, the red bud is not a bad one because they don't produce the same kind of a fruit the same way. And, and yeah. other. So there's other examples here at the Arboretum people could look at and say, I like a flowering tree, but I don't yeah. want to deal with the fruit aspect. They can come here, look at some of these other ones, and, and go from there. That's right. Okay. And do your research. Make sure you plant them in the right soil types, the right mm -hmm. locations. Like the red buds, while the crab apples are planted in full sun, mm -hmm. the red buds prefer to kind of be a little bit protected from full sun. Okay. Many times you see them grown as understory trees. Yep. We try to plant them so that the hot sun, they're in the shade. Okay. And they seem to do very well that okay, way. Good. So always do your homework. Yep. Not only on the selection you're making for disease and insects, but also for its cultural conditions mm -hmm. soil shade those yeah. kind of things and then yeah. remember moisture as uh, moisture uh, maybe even ph but that's again a little yeah. bit technical because a lot of people don't know the ph of their soil and they may have but a difficult time still very it important with it's certain important plants with certain plants yeah. yeah and then location is to you know think about when you plant that tree you know how tall is this thing going to get what is it going to run into in my house or yard and <laughs> what is it going to drop on places i want to walk on those kind yeah. of things so yeah. so there you have it the crab apple, one of the more popular spring flowering trees, it has a rich history both worldwide as well as here in the Midwest. By providing a variety of colors in the spring with their fragrant and beautiful flowers, their brilliant contrasting foliage colors in the fall, and ecological benefits to both early pollinators in the spring and providing a late season food source for those wintering birds and mammals in our area. While some challenges do come with planting and caring for crab apple trees, these are fairly manageable if a person does their research beforehand and selects the variety of crab apple that is right for them and their landscape. There are also other examples of flowering trees at the Arboretum that visitors can observe to get an idea of the options that may work for their area. I would like to thank David Horst for his wonderful insights into the history of the collection at the Arboretum and his wonderful knowledge on the planting, maintenance, and care for this popular tree, and to Otis Welch for the musical selection.